my friend Flicker, chapter 25. Ken's nights were no longer dreamless. There was no peace for the boy. By day his new responsibility, his passionate hope, his meticulous care of Flicker, and by night a procession of dream adventures, sometimes terrible ones. Often his mutterings and cries brought his mother or father to his bedside. Something was ever, and ferociously, at his heels. It was an agony, and his appearance changed in a way that was noticeable. Both boys usually grew taller during the summer vacations, and put on weight too. But Ken had gained no weight this summer, only height and his face was strained and anxious. But through the agony ran a thread of something so exciting that he was strung like a taut bow. There was the first thrilling whiff of real achievement. It was not only his hands that had changed, or the listlessness of the daydreamer. The sliding away from reality had gone. He looked, stood, moved, eagerly and with determination. He was in love. He was in the very core of life and he wrestled with it as Jacob wrestled with the angel. The achievement was flicker and the winning of her friendship. He had a horse now. He had her in the same intimate sense that Howard had high boy. He couldn't ride her yet, but she was his because she had given herself to him. She loved his hands, his touch, his caresses. She loved to have him stand at her head, facing her, his hands lightly holding her cheeks. They looked into each other's eyes as lovers look. He spent all the time with her that he could. While she stood eating her oats, his hands smoothed the satin soft skin under her mane. It had a nap as deep as plush. He played with her long cream-coloured tresses, arranged her forelock neatly between her eyes. She was a bit dish-faced, like an Arab, with eyes set far apart. Ken kept a curry comb and brush in the crotch of the cottonwood tree, and lightly groomed and brushed her. Flicker enjoyed this, as he moved about her, first on one side, then the other, kneeling down to brush her legs and polish her small hoofs, which had the colour and sheen of cream-coloured marble, she turned her head to him, and always, if she could, rested her muzzle on him. Ken grew used to the feel of the warm, moist lips against his shoulder or back, and his mother complained of all the polo shirts he dirtied, tending to flicker. He spoiled her. Soon she would not step to the stream to drink, but he must hold a bucket for her. And she would drink, then lift her dripping muzzle, rest it on his shoulder, her golden eyes dreaming off into the distance, then daintily dip her mouth and drink again. When she turned her head to the south and pricked her ears and stood tense and listening, Ken knew she heard the other colts galloping on the upland. You'll go back there some day, Flicker, he whispered. You'll be three and I'll be twelve. You'll be so strong you won't know I'm on your back. And we'll fly like the wind. We'll stand on the very top where we can look over the whole world and smell the snow from the never summer range. Maybe we'll see antelope. As her leg got better, Flicker took to following Ken around. She came hopping at his whistle or call, and turned, and kept beside him as he walked. He would have his hand under her chin, or around under her neck and up the other side of her face, hugging her, or just resting on her neck lightly, with a strand of her mane between his fingers. This was what he had always dreamed of, that he should have a horse of his own that would come at his call and follow him of its own accord. Now and then, walking down to give her her oats, he stopped and thought about it in a daze of bliss. 
just what his father had said. She looked for him as if he was her whole life. She didn't seem to think of anything but him. Before breakfast, when he came through the cow-bound corrals, carrying the can of oats, she was waiting at the gate for him, nickering. She nosed for the can of oats. He held it away and hurried down the path, telling her that the proper place for her to have her oats was in the nursery. Flicker hopped along by his side. She knew as well as he where they were going, and when they reached the hill, ran ahead and was standing over the box when he poured the oats in. After breakfast, when Ken went down again, his mother was with him, and Paulie the cat at her heels. And again Flicker knew what to expect, and was waiting at the corral gate. She turned and hopped in front of them, leading the way to the nursery, and when she got there, stood in the accustomed place, holding up her hind leg for Ken to take the bandage off. All her timidity had gone, nothing frightened her now. With her acceptance of Ken, there seemed to have come to her a conviction that all men were friendly and safe, and their queer doings harmless. Every day, when the bandage was removed, the wound sponged and washed with disinfectant, and the new poultice and bandage put on, Ken made a fire on the other side of the fence in the practice field and burned the old dressings. All the time Flicker listened to Ken talking to his mother, turning from one to the other, as if she could understand them. Dad says she can understand, said Ken. Anyway, she can talk. I understand about six of the things she says. His mother boasted. Polly can talk too. She can say seven things. What? challenged Ken. She can say, Oh, good morning, good morning, good morning. I have been waiting the longest time for you. That's when she's been waiting in the kitchen for me to come down and make breakfast. And she can say, Oh, please, can't I have it? And, All right for you. And, Well, what do you want now? And, Isn't this a lovely day? Let's do something. And, oh, leave me alone. That's when she's a nervous woman. And, I'm just a poor little helpless cat trying to get along in the world. That's seven, said Ken. She can really say more than that, because she says something every time I speak to her. Just a word, maybe. What word? demanded Ken enviously. It depends. What? or yes, or thanks, or oh, the dickens. To prove it, Nell looked at Paulie who was lying on the bank, crouched like a sphinx, her yellow eyes half open, and spoke her name sharply. Paulie's reply was as quick as the bounce of a ball, a little sharp questioning cry. Well, what do you want? This, Ken had to admit, was more than he could get out of Flicker. The filly's physical condition was improving. She ran all over the calf pasture on three legs. She was up on the hillside near the three pines in the early morning, broadside to the sun, getting what Nell said was her radium treatment. And the first thing when Ken woke in the morning, he looked out of his window and saw her there, standing in profile, motionless as a statue, her head hanging low and relaxed, as all horses stand for their sun baths. The poultices drained and cleansed the deep wound above the hock, and the soreness was relieved, so that Flicker had no difficulty in getting up from either side alone. Soon she began to use the leg in walking, and then Nell said it was time to discontinue the poultices. The achievement which Ken had been getting just a hint of, like the scent of something delicious but far away tickling the nostrils of a hound, was more than a hint now. It was a reality, a victory that filled his lungs and shone from his eyes and gave strength to his hands. Flicker was his. Flicker had recovered. Flicker loved him. There was only one more thing. Dad, he said at supper that night, Flicker's my friend now. She likes me. I'm glad of that, son, said McLaughlin. It's a fine thing to have a horse for a friend. 
Ken's face was strained. And her legs better, he said. It doesn't hurt her. So? Well, what? Well, we've got to find out, don't we? Find out what? If she's loco. Loco? Ah! Oh. McLaughlin grunted and frowned. She's not loco. But you said we wouldn't know until we began her training. Have you had that in your head all this time? That little filly's got a ni as nice a disposition as any horse I ever knew. But Dad, how do we know? She might be crazy, like Rocket. Like she was herself up in the stables. If we tried to put a rope on her, and she's got to be halter broke. McLaughlin looked at his small son with a quizzical grin on his face. Ah, oh, that's what you want, is it? Some help in breaking that wild woman. Kenny nodded. Rob's eyes sought Nell's and then he pushed back his chair, took out his pipe and looked out of the window gravely. I think we might do that tomorrow, he said finally. Yes, I think I'll have time, right after breakfast. When supper was over, Ken fled from the table and ran to take Flicker her oats. He told her all about it. He stood smoothing her mane. He begged her to be good. He assured her there was nothing to be afraid of in being halter broken. He told her how he and Howard had halter broken the colts, that the colts had liked it. They had all had fun together. He begged her, he begged her, oh flicker. He began to think of what would happen if she wasn't good. He thought of Rocket and then the hole. And then he laid his face against Flicker's mane and stopped talking to her because he couldn't tell her about those things. She just wouldn't understand. Nell came looking for him. She liked to pay a little visit every day to Flicker. They walked up through the pasture together. The air was sweet with the perfume of wild roses. In the sunset, there were long horizontal bands of deep rose and golden pink with dark blue sky in between. There was a massive mauve and violet cloud above. A sickle moon rode in the midst of the colour with one star drawn close. Nell seized Ken by the shoulder and whirled him around before he saw it. There's a new moon in the sky. Kenny, look at it over your left shoulder and that's good luck. Ken obediently looked. He didn't want to stop looking. If it was good luck, oh, if it was good luck. That's the end of chapter 25.